Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. Pastor Joel has gone for a couple weeks, and so you've got me. We are in the book of Philippians, taking that throughout the summer, calling it the summer of joy. So I think this is our third talk in this series, and we are looking at verses 12 through 14 this morning. But I heard about a study um, uh, was taken on a couple of children. They're trying to respond to how, how they're trying to look at how people respond to tests. Can I help you? Okay. No, we're good. All right. How people respond to tests. So they put these little boys in these rooms, a 30, like a 30 by 30 room. And uh, the, first, the first set of boys, they go into this room, and everybody's, it's, it's a clean, open room. They're laughing, they're playing, they're running around, making games, doing what, you know, whatever, and they're having a great time. And so they take a little break, they get out for a little while, and then they put them back in the second room. The second room was a real similar size, but they put something in the middle of it. They put a bunch of manure in it, a bunch of cow or, or horse manure in it with hay and all kinds of stuff. And the first little boy was like, ah, mommy, it stinks in here. And he's trying to get out. He's like beating on the door, trying to get out, looking for his mom and dad to get him out of this place. The second little boy was in the same room. He's running around the room still, going crazy, jumping on the manure, jumping in the manure, tossing it over there, throwing it to the other boys, like laughing and stuff. And they're like, hey, why are you responding this way? He goes, well, I figured with all of this stuff in this room, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> and I love that. Many of us probably heard that. And that's exactly what's kind of taking place right here in this particular chapter or in this particular book because Paul is actually in a place that feels like a bunch of manure. He's in prison. He's getting beaten. He's gotten, you know, persecuted over and over again. But Paul looks and reframes it. The title of this morning's message is Faith Framer. Faith Framer. You and I need to be faith framers. In verses 12, it goes something like this. Now, um, Paul, Pastor Joel already said, hey, um, when, Paul, when Paul wrote this letter, he already thanked them. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a people that he really endears very, very much in his heart. He loves these people. They came to his aid while he was in prison. There's a lot of things that took place be, before that. But he loves them very much, and he prays for them and encourages them. And then he says, the first thing I want you to know, here's what I want you to know. You've probably heard about the stripes. You've probably heard about the beatings. You've probably heard about all this stuff that's happening in my life. But here's what I want you to know. In verse 12, he says, dear ones, what has happened to me hasn't hindered me. It's helped me. It's helped my ministry to advance the gospel, causing it to expand and spread to many people. For now, the elite Roman guards and government officials overseeing the imprisonment have plainly recognized that I'm here because of the love that you have for the anointed one. He goes, in other words, man, the, 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 the opportunity that's right before me, even though I'm in prison, it's actually turned out for the better of everyone. It turned out in such a way that it brought curiosity to even the, the, the elite Roman, the imperial guard at that time. Some of them were chained to him. And so they would see this guy respond in a different manner, and it would provoke curiosity. It's like, who, there's something different about that guy. What is that? They got to share that with other individuals. There's a lot of folks that were next to him as Roman imperial guards. And he was, these guys were the elite, the, the elite, the elite, the elite. And so there's a, a powerful influence that took place right there. And then he goes on to say, he goes, and what I'm going through right now has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous in the Lord and to be bold and passionate to preach the word of God all because of my chains. And I don't know about you, but if I ever, if I ever see individuals who are walking in God and they, 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 they have a trial, there's a major thing going on, and then they rise up in those places, in, in those moments, and they, they still see God, they still move forward in the power of God's spirit, even though they're certain Circumstances have never changed. I don't know about you, but that makes me, that emboldens my faith. It encourages it. It inspires me to just stay steadfast and stay steady in life. And this is what was going on with the apostle Paul. He could have written this letter in a very different manner. He could have written it like some of us that goes something like this. He goes, hey, everyone, the devil is hindering me from advancing this gospel. I'm chained and I can't get to you. Other jealous preachers see this as an opportunity. They need disciples, and they're going to take advantage of you all. Don't trust anyone. Don't preach anything. This jail is no joke. Don't say nothing. Just hide in your house. <laughs> Could have easily said that, but that's not what he wrote, right? He's a faith framer. Paul never allowed what was wrong in his life to keep him from wor wor worshiping what was right about God. 
And that's a, that's, that's the, that's a, a quality of, of a faith framer right there. You know, I found out in life that there's basically three types of people. People who cry, people who try, and people who trust. People who cry are individuals who are always crying about the situation that they're facing. Wah, 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 wah. You know what happened to me? Oh, man, and you know what happened when I went to that? I went to the hospital and I got hurt again. I'm like, oh, my God, really? You know, you know anybody who cries all the time? Anybody have people like that living in your own house? <laughs> They're individuals who cry. They're always complaining about it. There's nothing ever right in life. There are other individuals who try. In other words, they're trying constantly to, they don't like the situation, so they try to take matters in their own hands, and they try to make the situation change on their own terms. <laughs> Anybody know people like that? I'm not going to say, but I know exactly who that person is. <laughs> and it's, and then there's people who trust. There are people who trust. They leverage the moment, whatever they're facing, they look for the opportunity in that moment on how they can use it to, to, to share Christ or to, to leverage it so that they can reflect the character and nature of our Heavenly Father. Mm. People who trust God have that type of influence. They free frame that trial into an opportunity for triumph. And people who cry, people who try are usually operating out of what I call fragile faith. It's weak faith. It's not wrong faith. It's just well, you can't maintain a steadfast walk in Jesus if you operate in, in this type of fragile faith. Fragile faith looks something like this. It's, it's, like, it's like having inherited faith. I, I shared this on Wednesday night. It's faith that's been transmitted from people that love you and respect you. It could be your pastor, your friend, someone who's coaching you in your walk. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. But it's secondhand faith Jesus. It's secondhand faith. It's not firsthand faith. Jesus wants you to know him on a personal, on a personal level. The, the inherited faith rests upon the shoulders of the individual who's ministering to you, who's coaching you. Well, what if he's having a bad day? What if his faith is not strong in that moment? I used to have a pastor who was just a giant in faith, Pastor Freeborn. I mean, every time I had some kind of request, you know, something going on in my life, I'd go to pastor. I'm young in the Lord, probably one year old in the Lord. And man, the crazy thing was that every time you would pray, the, the answer would come. Like, life would change. I'm like, man, this guy's got power in him. Like, I'm just going to keep my, taking my request to him. Well, that happened. He carried me on his faith for a while till after several months, I would go do the same routine, and I noticed that the prayers weren't getting answered. I'm like, man, I think Pastor Freeborn, he might be in sin. There's something wrong with him. <laughs> something ain't right. And so I, I would say, hey, Pastor, we prayed last week, but can you pray again this week? Because... Something's not happening. He goes, he just chuckled. He knew exactly what was going on. And what was going on? What was going on is God was trying to weed me off of this man's faith to have firsthand faith in Jesus. You trust right now this man to go to me and then I would answer. Well, you can go to me just like he's going to me. Trust me. Go to me. I don't know how to pray. Just talk. Okay. And so that's exactly what takes place right there. We have, some of us have inherited faith, and we need to transition over into an adulthood state where it's just firsthand. Others have shallow faith. It's faith that's barely alive. It's there on the surface of the earth. You are one storm away from drifting back to what, who you were, once were. It's shallow. It's circumstantial. And then you've got other individuals who have conditional faith. I call it emotional faith. If your condition is good, you're joyful and great. But if the condition changes and it's uncomfortable, you change. Your faith, you set that aside and your survival skills start rising up and you will control the circumstance. Sometimes we just need to let the circumstance just simmer and let God do something in our lives. Faith on his terms, not our own terms. Then we have genuine faith, unhypocritical faith, strong faith, resilient faith, honoring faith, enduring faith. These are individuals who fight from the place of victory, not for a place of victory. They understand what God's given to them. They understand their inheritance. I always tell our leadership, because like, hey, whenever you're choosing leaders, look for individuals who are faithfully and, and consistently walking, not for their victory, but from their victory. Big difference, right? Big difference. They understand their identity in him, and it just takes time. They walk from that place of victory. 
from that. So whenever I chose my elders, I didn't choose them overnight. I didn't choose them just because they're great, happy Christians. It took me over several years to watch them. Because I can see that it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, hey, man, hallelujah, on Sunday morning. But I had to wait to see how they would respond in the middle of their trial. Not one trial, several trials. And I finally, I was like, man, I know exactly who needs to be an elder in this church. Why? Because they responded out of the place of victory. They understood their identity in Christ. That's fighting from victory, not for victory. Amen? What has happened to me? The Apostle Paul said, hasn't hindered me. It's helped me. It's helped the gospel. It's advancing the gospel. Isn't that the same as saying, hey, if God's for me, who can be against me? Isn't that the same as saying, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It's the same thing as saying that. A little bit later in Philippians 2, verse 19, I think we'll touch it next week, I'm not sure. The, 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 the apostle Paul says, these things that have happened to me, this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Even though he was in the middle of all this stuff, he goes, it, I'm not moved by what's going on in my life. This will turn out to my deliverance. That's the mindset of a faith framer. It's a different mindset. In other words, they say, hey, this might be my current situation, but it's not my final destination. I'm just passing through this thing. The challenge that I'm facing in life, it's inevitable, but it's not going to be de- defeated. It, it, uh, it allowing it to defeat me is optional. And I'm the one that will determine whether or not I'm going to be defeated or not. I will walk in victory. I would always tell my girls, they'd be so mad at me. He goes, goes, Dad, well, I want to play with you. I'll never lose. I'm like, what do you mean you'll never lose? He goes, I'll never lose to you or to anybody else. Well, what if I score more points? It's like, I still win. <laughs> it, was, it was just the mindset I was trying to get them. I was like, you, you go into this place already winning because that's the victory that he's given to us in Christ. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Everything you need, Marcus, is already inside of you. I've got the greater one inside of you. The trials we face are not meant to reveal how, how they're going to make you fail. No, they're going to reveal how far you can fly. That's good. If you just have a different framework. The Apostle Paul has that mindset. And for those that connected with him, that was kind of rubbing off on other individuals as well. Think about David, a little shepherd boy. You know, whenever, before he faced Goliath, he was a little shepherd boy. He was out there with livestock, with sheep, with his little animals. I don't know about you, but as a kid, I used to have little dogs and little weenie dogs. I used to pray for my dogs. I used to pray for my animals. That God would bless them. He'd make them become longer or whatever it was. <laughs> it, was just, it was just cute. I would always pray for them. Well, I'm sure just like I would want the best for my, my animals, David wanted the best for his. And I'm sure there are times he would pray. He says, God, protect my, my sheep, protect my livestock. You know, God's, uh, my dad's put me in charge. Please protect me. Watch over it. And it seemed as if, though, God wouldn't answer those prayers. Why? Because he had to fight off bears. He had to fight off lions. He had to fight out all these animals. I'm sure there were times like he just prayed that, and then this bear comes, comes, or this lion comes, and he's fighting. He goes, God, can't you, do you see this? Aren't you, why don't you answer my prayers? And it wasn't until fast forward, he's facing Goliath, and it's all of a sudden, it's like, thank God he didn't answer those prayers. Looking back, the fight with the lions, the fight with the bears, that's just target practice for what I needed right now. And sometimes you're facing stuff right now. It feels like, man, get me out of this situation. I'm going to ask you to reframe and ask God, what do you want me to get out of this situation? It could be the very thing that you need. Maybe not now, but in the future, you're going to see that it's just target practice right now. Let me just fly through this thing, upholding the character and nature, upholding integrity in my heart, upholding my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. I heard of a silversmith who uh, was once asked, how do you know when the impurities are burned away from the silver, in the silver? And he said, when I can see the reflection of myself in that silver, that's when I know all the impurities have gone. And the same is true with us. When you and I can walk in and out of a trial and come out reflecting the character and nature of our Heavenly Father, when people can see the image of Jesus inside of us, that's when you've transitioned into a faith framer and you become an influencer for the gospel's sake. He is so good to us, and he's empowering us to do that. Amen? Amen. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. Well, I don't know if I have that. You have that. I promise you, you have that. There's nothing that you're facing right now in life that God will not use the fragment of it for his glory and for his honor in the future or even right now in the present. 
I love it when people, when I see what they're going through, I don't like that they're going through this stuff, but I like to see how they keep coming back. They keep asking, they keep believing, they keep trusting. Look, I don't understand, Pastor, because, but all I know is that my faith is going to stay steadfast in him. I said, that's beautiful right there. So that's how you need to live your life, the rest of your life. What if it never goes well? It's okay. Listen, I have a lot of things to complain about in life. I feel like I've given everything to Jesus my whole life after I came to him. I feel like I deserve something because of my sacrifices. <laughs> and he still said, he goes, I don't need your sacrifices. I already have one that's sacrificed. I need your obedience. I'm like, oh, man. But look at all this money I gave. Look at all this Bible I read. Look at all these people I'm talking to. I remember I got into this room with my daughter who was going through a divorce. I'm fixing to walk through another door with other stuff going on with my other daughter. Actually, all three daughters. They're all crazy. <laughs> my God, what's wrong with them? My dad's in the hospital, you know, thinking he's got cancer. Natalie's dad had a stroke. It's just on and on and on. I'm like, man, God, I felt, is this what I get? <laughs> I can hear the words just like they were spoken to me that day. Marcus, do I owe you anything? No, sir. You don't owe me anything. I owe you everything. I owe you everything. And what got me through that situation is going to get me through this situation. I can't control any of that, but here's what I can control. How I reflect. My gift to you is how I respond to this circumstance in life. And I choose to honor you in the middle of it. That's a faith framer. That's what he wants to do. We have a different mindset. We have a different kingdom. The Spirit of God is on the inside of us. We're different people. We have a different approach. We have different values. We spend our money differently. We treat our children differently. We honor our spouses differently. We, we spend money differently. We raise our families differently. We approach trials different. We influence culture. We never let culture influence us. Why? Because the greater one is on the inside of us. And we have what it takes to overcome. We have the victory. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes even your faith. When Jesus comes back, he goes, will I ever find any faith on this earth when I return? That's what was being restored. He's looking. He wants you to be strong, but not just strong in giving or strong in reading or strong in any. He wants you to be strong in your faith and your trust level in him. Will you trust him for that house? Will you trust him for that spouse? Will you trust them for that mouse? I'm just trying to rhyme. I don't know. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> we have a mouse in the house. Oh, there's another word. We trust, yeah. And it's, a, I love that little mouse. It's a pet. Natalie does not like him. But still, will you trust him? Yeah. C.S. Lewis, lose it, lose, lose it. C.S. Lewis, it. <laughs> C.S. Lewis says it this way: Many of our prayers are misguided. Many of our prayers would short circuit God's plan and purpose for our lives if He answered them. Maybe we should stop asking God to get us out of the difficult circumstances and start asking Him, "What does He want us to get out of those difficult circumstances?" Wow. Isn't that so true? Most difficulties, even the ones you're currently in, are actually divine opportunities for growth, for development. And for his glory, if we just reframe it. Adversity is the seedbed for, op for opportunity. My pastor always used to tell me, he goes, Marcus, when all stuff happens, when all hell breaks loose, there's always an opportunity right there. Look for it. And man, we see that all the time. When it comes to church work, big picture, hurricanes, stuff happens, something crazy is going on in life, tornadoes, whatever it is, I was like, hey, be ready. For what? Because I don't know, but there's going to be an opportunity right here for the church to be the light in the middle of the darkness. We always hear folks, and this is kind of, it kind of bothers me, but I just want to, you know, maybe I need to do a message on things that bother me <laughs> and just share that. The thing, one of the things that bothers me is like, they're just constantly hyping up the problems. They're constantly, they're making them bigger than what they really are. We all go through the same kind of things. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that are very difficult to go through. But still, I think m most of life is just how we manage suffering. <laughs> that's what I've come to my conclusion. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's like that's all I feel like. I'm just, so I'm constantly reframing, reframing. I can't allow these things to dictate my art. 
I can't allow him to dictate my future. My pastor used to say, he goes, Marcus, don't ever let your past dictate your future. Stay settled. Lock that thing in. Stay steady. I was on the west side of uh, Seguin one day, early on as a, as a minister, as, a, as a, just a Christian. And somebody asked me, to, hey, I want to hear your story. We have some people that are going to come in to this church. I need you to go and, and share your story. I was like, okay, looking for an opportunity. I kind of didn't want to go, not because I didn't want to share. I didn't want to go because it was cold. It was like 30 degrees. It's like, man, I got to go out there. Let's just go quickly to this church and go share our story. And then we can go eat some barbecue or whatever. And so I go to this church, Natalie and I, it's on the west end there, little bitty church. And I know I could not get into that church and get warmer because there's a big old hole in the door of the church. So it was just as cold inside as it was outside. And so we walk in there. And as soon as we walk in, we walk in and boom, everything, all the lights went out. Everything just went dark. There's nothing, no electricity, no nothing. And they're looking at us. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just walk, walked in this place. And so, but I knew in, in my spirit, I was like, man, the enemy's up to no good right here. Was, but I know I'm destined to be here. I know I have to be here. And so they went around trying to fix it. They couldn't fix anything. They found out that the, not only transformer blew, but the breaker thing blew. So somebody happened to have another one. They went, they said, hey, we'll be back in about 20 minutes. We waited out there. They brought back the breaker and they put it in there, turned it on, still no lights, no nothing. And they were scurrying around. I'm like, hey guys, listen, let's just pray. So we got there on the stage, prayed, prayer of faith. And I said, man, God, all I need is one light. And all I need is one socket because I had a TV that I was going to share a message with. So after the prayer, there's no lights anywhere except for the one in the pulpit. I got a string and I clicked it. The light, the only light that worked in that building was right over the pulpit. And the only plug that ever worked in that room the rest of that evening was right here by this pulpit. I plugged it in, turned my TV on, and just preached the message and shared my story. Isn't that beautiful? But here's what's more beautiful. I didn't know who these people were. Then this other family comes in late and stuff. I was like, man, these are rude. What's wrong with these people? And so I preached the message, shared the message, and one person, one family responds. It's the late family response. They come in. They get ministered to. And I was like, who are you guys? They get loved on. Some of them got saved. Some of them got restored, rededicated their life. And it was just a beautiful moment. Afterwards, here's what they tell me. He goes, I said, are you guys from? He goes, no, we're actually from San Antonio on our way to Houston. He goes, and we had car problems. So we just decided to get off of this exit. It happens to be seeking an exit. We get off of that, get on the road, take a right at some block, and go around the block. And this church happens to be there. And we see cars there. So we park our car there. And our little family gets out. And we go and be a part of the service. He goes, and that message is exactly what I needed in my life for my future and what I'm facing. And they got to minister God's message and God's love. I could have easily given that whole meeting up and said, you know what? Don't worry about it, guys. Everything's out. I'll come back next week. But no, I reframed it. Like there's an opportunity right here, a divine seed of opportunity. God, what is it? Show me how to press through. And we did. He did. They did. He gets the glory. Amen. Listen, it doesn't matter what you're facing in life. The bottom line, you have to reframe your trial before it redefines your life. You can't let these trials redefine you. You are who he created you to be. Rise up in the power of God's spirit, reframe it, and just rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. James said, count it all joy when you fall into these places. Is that hard? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. By his spirit. Amen. So what do we do with all that? Thank you for asking. One, this week, ask yourself, hey, what's my current faith revealing right now? Am I operating in fragile faith and inherited faith and shallow faith, conditional faith? Or man, am I, am I locked in here? Now understand, we go back and forth to these things. There's times that I'm weak, I'm feeling just distressed or whatever, and it's shallow. It's like I feel like I'm one, one more trial away from just quitting. I know I never will, but I, just, I feel that way sometimes, or it's emotional or whatever. Because but where are you at? Locate yourself. It's a good place to locate yourself. Second thing is don't pray for a lighter load. Pray for a stronger back. Pray for resilience. Pray for God to, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Apostle Paul prayed. He goes, not only will I live for him, I'll suffer for him. He saw, he, the mindset that he had was totally different than most of us. He looked at those 
those moments as opportunities to glorify Father, the Father in the middle of those things. And you know what? You know how it helped the gospel and advanced the gospel? People became curious. The elite soldiers, they became curious. And the other brothers in Christ, they saw how he pressed on through those moments. They became more bold and courageous. So it impacts people. How we respond really, really impacts individuals in life. And then the third thing is, remember the words of the Lord Jesus to Simon. You know, Simon was a, much like us, hard-headed, you know, denying the Lord, making promises only to go back on his promises, taking a knife out, cutting off a ear. He was totally Mexican. He was just crazy. And then, that's probably not a good thing to say anyways, right? So, so in the middle of all that, in the middle of all that, he still turned, Jesus prays for you, Simon, Satan's trying to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. I prayed that your faith would fail not. And whenever you get strong again, go strengthen your brothers. And I say that to say this to you. You're facing stuff right now that might be feeling overwhelming in your life. But I want you to know this. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's still making intercession on your behalf. He's praying for you. What's he praying for? That your faith would not fail. And after you're finished and you're complete and he's worked that out, go strengthen another brother. Go strengthen a friend. Come over here to the church and help us minister and disciple these young teenagers or these young children. Because that's what we need. That's what the family of God is. And we continue to do that in a city, in a family. Man, the whole, the thing just changes one family at a time. That's just the way it is. So a few years ago, I went to a uh, hike with Pastor Joel. We went to the Grand Canyon. We hiked um, Have a Supply. The Have a Supply is, uh, is, is down into the canyon, and there's some Indians down there. It's beautiful. Water. It's just absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. I was down there. You have a picture, right? Yeah. There's some other pictures I should have brought. And um, when I was down there the second night, the second or third night, they decided to make dinner for us or like a, like a dinner kind of a thing. It was just burgers and fries and stuff. They have their own little town down there. And we ate, I ate, and then I was on my way out back to the campsite. It's about a half a mile up, but it was getting dark. And I didn't exactly know, I knew kind of the path was this way, but I didn't know that there's a lot of paths in that path. So it got dark by the time I started the path. And I'm like, and then top it all off, when I entered that path, I stepped on poop. I'm like, oh man, that sucks. So I'm like sitting there, one, I didn't know how to get back to camp. Two, there's paths everywhere. And three, there's poop on my feet. And then I realized like, oh my gosh. I, I remember that by that camp, there was horses, there was mules that went through there. The path to my destination is through this trail of poop. And so I just like looked for the next poop. <laughs> it was fresh. I'd go down there and there's different ways to go. And I'm like, there's more poop over there. The next thing I know, I was at, at the destination. And I was like, yeah, I made it. Because listen, it's dark out there and it was cold. And I was like, there's all kinds of stuff, bears, whatever. I don't know what, but I made it. So here's my, my point in life is this, is that sometimes the path to your victory is through a trail of poop. And you might be facing this stuff right now in your life that feels like poop and smells like poop, but I want you to know, reframe it. Faith frame this thing and watch God do what he wants to do in your life. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. You are so good to us. We thank you, Lord God, that whatever we face in life, it doesn't come without an opportunity to reflect your goodness and your character. Lord, show us how that, how that is. Show us how we can, we can make that adjustment in our current situation. So we just trust you. We speak your blessings over this family, Lord God. Honor them this week, you pray in Christ's name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. amen. Love you guys. We'll see you Wednesday, or if not, we'll see you next Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.